All right. Here we go. Now we saw last week that Paul began his third missionary journey from Syrian Antioch. When he did that, he headed north and evidently visited the churches in Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch, those churches that he had planted before. And before Paul's arrival back in Ephesus, you remember he stopped there briefly, and now he's going on his third missionary journey, he, he arrives back there. But in between those two visits, before his arrival back in Ephesus, Apollos, a learned or eloquent Jew from Alexandria, he came to Ephesus And Priscilla and Aquila taught him about the spirit-related baptism that Jesus had instituted, and he presumably was baptized. As I explained last week, I think that's what Luke would have his readers assume. That makes more sense to me than thinking Luke's going to have them assume that he rebelled against that teaching. Now, he was then sent, Apollos was sent by the brothers in Ephesus, He was sent to the church there in Corinth. Now, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he met the 12 or so disciples of John the Baptist, and he taught them and baptized them, and they received the Holy Spirit, and they were moved to speak in tongues and to prophesy. And I suggested to you that the the Spirit visibly and objectively manifested his indwelling presence in them to make it unmistakable that John's disciples, perhaps representing all groups with erroneous religious beliefs, but he made clear that John's disciples, they were included in the scope of the gospel. Mistaken religious views did not disqualify them from from the offer of salvation in Christ. So I think that's what was going on, and we, we see that there. And then Paul entered the synagogue where he taught Uh, he taught the same synagogue where he had taught on his prior brief visit there. Remember, they wanted him to stay, and he said, I'll return if it's God's will. Well, he's back in that synagogue, and he taught for three months, speaking boldly there, reasoning and persuading them, here Luke says, about the kingdom of God. Now, you may recall that Luke reported in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that during the 40 days after his resurrection, that Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God. And he said that Philip preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. So preaching, see when he's saying, when Paul is persuading them that Jesus is the Christ, you see in Acts, for example, in Acts 9, 22, and 17.3 and Acts 18.5. When he's persuading them that Jesus is the Christ, that is persuading them about the kingdom of God. You see, those things, those things are related because the Christ, the Messiah, he is the one through whom God establishes his kingdom. You see, that state of creation in which his sovereignty, God's sovereignty, is fully and completely expressed such that everything is in harmony and conformity with his ultimate will and purpose. It is the divine utopia. The kingdom of God is the divine utopia of the new heavens and new earth. It's that state in which all things will have been set right. That state of humanity's longing since the invasion has corrupted existence. We have all longed for that time, that reality, when everything will be put right. And that's what he's talking about. It's a time when the redeemed will exist eternally in a perfect reality of love and joy, and fellowship with God and one another. It's, just, it's the absolute, it's the greatest. And so in speaking about the Messiah, he is the one through whom God brings this about, as I've explained many times. To contrary to the Jewish expectations of how the, how the, about the kingdom of God in the first century, 
their understanding that it was a one-shot deal, that here we have the old age going along, the kingdom of God comes, and then we have the eternal age and the eternal order. Well, Jesus taught uh, many times about the kingdom of God, that it was contrary to that expectation, that the kingdom of God, in fact, comes in two stages. Michael Byrd, in his book on Paul, he says, the coming of Jesus has inaugurated a new era of redemptive history and God's new age has been launched upon the world. Something like a covert operation seizing key nodes along the rear echelons of an opposing force. Those people who confess faith in the Messiah and experience the transforming power of the Spirit of God are living billboards in our global metropolis advertising God's activity in the world and pointing to things soon to come. At the same time, the old age continues. Death and evil are realities that need to be confronted and endured, but their power has been broken in principle and even in practice. What is more, the day is coming when God will finally do away with them, and the old age will be no more. On that day, God will be all in all. That is the day that is coming. And D.A. Carson, in one of his works, says, Sometimes Jesus speaks of the kingdom as already having dawned. It's already here, operating secretly, as it were. It's like yeast that is put into dough. It's already quietly working and having its effect. Yet elsewhere, Jesus speaks of the kingdom as what comes at the end when there is a final consummation and tremendous transformation. So the kingdom is already seen another way. It has not yet come. And that's an important... See, I've said many times, see, that is, a, that is a fundamental theological perspective of the New Testament, that the, that the kingdom of God is already and not yet. In different senses you have. Now, when, when some in the synagogue, when they stubbornly resisted, stubbornly, it's not like, you know, people have questions. They, no, no, these people are just completely hostile. So when they stubbornly resisted the truth of the gospel and they began speaking evil of Christianity, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, well, Paul stopped teaching there. You know, I mean, Paul's reading the situation. He says, you know, I'm, I'm trying to preach the gospel. The level has gotten so it's counterproductive now. And so he stops teaching there, and he took the disciples with him, and he began teaching daily in the hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus. So the apostle Paul is holding court. He's preaching and teaching and explaining all about the gospel of Christ. And this continued for two years. Now just think about it. Two years. You could go, drop down to the hall of Tyrannus and go listen to the Apostle Paul expound on God's work in this world. Expound on the gospel of Christ. And so many people were taught during that time of Paul's two years of teaching in Ephesus that the message radiated from Ephesus. So Paul is here. He's like the center, the nucleus. He's teaching people here for two years. So many, it radiated out from Ephesus to such an extent that Luke says hyperbolically that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now you're talking about an effective ministry this ministry had a tremendous effect on disseminating the gospel, right? Paul preaches, preaches, and it radiates out to a tremendous extent all through the world. Paul is being used to infect the world, as it were, with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And now Paul's preaching, it was accompanied by extraordinary miracles. You see, these are miracles that are, there's something odd about them. It was accompanied by extraordinary miracles God was doing through Paul. Right? God's doing the miracles, but he was doing them through Paul, confirming the truth of Paul's message. So he's, God's doing extraordinary miracles. 
Paul himself referred in some of his letters to the signs, wonders, and mighty works that accompanied his ministry. How God was working through him in his ministry. For example, in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And Romans chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, you see him referring to that. Now, for his reasons, for God's reasons, God, in the case of Paul in Ephesus, he healed the sick and the demon-possessed to whom handkerchiefs or aprons Paul had touched were brought. So you have this kind of remote miracle. Remember, he did, he did extraordinary miracles. Well, these are remote miracles that God, for his purpose, is doing through Paul in Ephesus. So Paul would have contact with something that would be taken somewhere else, and God would heal the person who had contact with it. Now, that's really something going on there, right? And this remote healing that he was doing in association with these Paul-related objects this remote, these Paul-connected objects, that was a further way of accrediting Paul. Pointing people, say, see, Paul is a messenger of God. It was a further way of accrediting him in a city that was a hotbed of magic. In the ancient world, Ephesus was a hotbed of magic. It was a city that emphasized the manipulation and control of spiritual forces through rituals and spells, incantations, and the use of names. So this was all about here. So God is doing these extraordinary miracles through Paul in that environment. As Daryl Bach says, he says, Paul is shown to be more than equal to anything Ephesus can offer. So you have all these people believing, thinking, seeing all these manipulations. Some may be real of what they're doing with spirits. And yet God accredits Paul in a way that is mind-blowing. And he's doing that to help reinforce Paul's message. And then we have the seven sons of a Jewish priest named Sceva. And these seven sons were itinerant exorcists, men who traveled about making a living by claiming an ability to cast out harmful spirits. Okay, so they're itinerant exor exorcists. That's what they do. They travel around, say, hey, for a fee, I can take care of you. And so now, uh, Sceva, this, this priest Sceva, David Peterson says, there is no Sceva in the list of Jewish high priests available to us. So he refers to him as a high priest Sceva, and you say, well, what do we know about Sceva? You say, well, we can't find him listed in one of the formal, in the formal office of high priest. But Peterson says, however, the word chief priest is regularly used in the plural, chief priests. In Luke's gospel and in Acts 4.23, apparently denoting members of the Jewish priestly aristocracy or of the court that determined issues relating to the priest and the temple. In other words, chief priest isn't always restricted to the formal office of chief priest. So that may be the answer. Maybe there was no somebody named Sceva who was a formal office holder. It's possible we just don't know about it. But it's not necessary that he be that because the, the, the term can be broader than the formal office holder. But anyway, we have this person here. We have uh, Sceva and having become aware of Jesus' power over demons, these seven sons who make their living going around saying, you know, for a fee I can exorcise these demons and things for you. So they had become aware of, of Jesus' power over demons, and they tried to appropriate that power for their own ministry. Okay, they're going to get in on this. They're thinking, hey, uh, this, this guy, this name, obviously is loaded. So they, they're going to use it for their own ministry. And they said over a demon-possessed man, I adjure or I command you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. I'm commanding you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. But the evil spirit called their bluff. This spirit calls their bluff. It responded, Jesus I know. And Paul, I recognize, 
But who are you? You see, who are you? That's, that's what the Spirit wants to know. In other words, you do not speak with the authority of Jesus. Paul, I recognize, because Paul is Christ's ambassador. He's somebody in whom Christ has invested his authority. He's an apostle. I understand Paul. And I certainly know Jesus. But you're simply saying the words, you're a poser, and I see you. That's what this spirit's telling them. They thought they could, you know, just manipulate. Oh, I'm just like magic. I got his name here. No, no, no. You have his name. You don't have his authority. It's the authority. That's what matters here. So the spirit-possessed man then wailed on all seven of them. Beat them to a pulp. And they they wind up running running from the place naked and wounded or bleeding. So this is a serious whipping. And this episode, it became known, as you can imagine, this became known throughout Ephesus. This was a big deal. These guys had been traveling around. Listen, we're exorcists doing this. This story became known what had happened. Everybody here in Ephesus is knowing about it. And as a result, the residents there, they were seized with a reverent fear of Jesus. See, through the demons implied recognition of Jesus' power. Say, what happened over there when the seven sons? What all happened? How'd you get beat up? Well, he went in there and said, and the demon says to him, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But because you lack any connection with him, you're not an agent of Christ. If you had been, it'd be a different story. So see, see that there is implicit in this acknowledgement of Christ's power. And they magnified Jesus' name as one who was above manipulation through magic arts. You see, these guys can't get to him. The exorcist and these people doing these things, they can't control the Lord Jesus and use him in their enterprise. He's above all that. So now you have these people in this city who are really, uh, they have this reverent fear of Christ. And given how the exorcists attempt to use the name of Jesus, their attempt to use the name of Jesus as a magic incantation for their own ends, given how that proved harmful to them, right? Trying to employ his name in a magical way. That proved harmful and nearly fatal for them. Well, given that, you see, some Christians in Ephesus, they were then convicted by that of the incompatibility of the Christian faith with engagement in magic arts. This caused the penny to drop for them. They had hung on to these things, thinking somehow they could incorporate those things into Christianity. But when they saw that, they're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, there is a fundamental inconsistency in who Jesus is and engaging in these kinds of things. As Daryl Bach says, he says, so they confess and divulge their practices turning from their past ways. In this context, the term praxis means magic spells or magical acts. Normally, it simply means deeds. Their divulging of spells is important, as one of the keys to magic is the secrecy and mystery behind the spells. Once made public, the spell is perceived to be impotent. So basically, they were throwing the spells away, right? They were were getting rid of the spells by by announcing them publicly and doing this kind of thing. He says, the fact that this, this realization, becomes evident to those who already believe shows their growing maturity in the faith. They did not appreciate this when they initially responded to Jesus, but now they see it. So this is what has triggered their, their you know, a, a heightened perception. They now realize, oh, I see this, and so they're coming out confessing and divulging their practices and beyond confessing their sin and divulging magic spells. Beyond doing that, a number of penitent Christians, they collected the books that they had retained, books of magic spells. And you and I think about that and we say, I don't know many people keep books of magic spells, but they, they had them. 
They had books in which they had magic spells and they had magic formulae that they had kept. And they brought all of these books and because of their conviction now of the incompatibility of engaging in magic with Christian faith, they burned those books publicly. It was a public act of repentance. The society could see that we reject, in being Christians, we reject this. And they wind up burning the books there. And the value of those works was 50,000 pieces of silver, probably referring to Greek drachmas. 50,000 pieces of silver. This is no small sum. This is no small sum. The, the note in the New English translation says another way to express the value would be in sheep. One drachma could buy one sheep. So this many drachmas could purchase a huge flock of sheep. A drachma also equals a denarius or a day's wage for the average worker. So this amount would be equal to 50,000 work days or in excess of 8,300 weeks of labor. The weeks are calculated at six working days because of the Jewish cultural context. So, I mean, this is huge, right? This is a sacrificial repentance for the world to see. This is something that is, that is very large. And then Luke in verse 20, he gives a summary of Paul's Ephesian ministry. He says, the word bore fruit as more and more people. This is what he's saying in essence. He says, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This word bore fruit as more and more people responded in faith to the preaching of Paul and to the witness of the Ephesian Christians. Right? He says, so... And to the witness of the Ephesian Christians through such examples as the personal sacrifices of publicly burning their magical books worth 50,000 pieces of silver. They said, you know, you know, oftentimes what people do with their money tells you what's really important to them. You know, you talk about all kinds of stuff, but, but will you help somebody by giving them your money? Hmm. I'd rather talk. And so when somebody comes out and says, because of my conviction that this is inconsistent with discipleship, I'm willing to burn all this stuff. Do you know how much that's worth? I'm burning it, baby. Why don't you sell it? No, because that would be corrupting other people. I'm not doing that. I'm burning it. And so you have this, you have this wind up here. Now, it was during his time in Ephesus. This was a tremendous ministry in Ephesus. Obviously, radiating out, radiating out into all of Asia. But it was during that time that Paul wrote the unpreserved letter to the Corinthian church that he refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. It was here in Ephesus that Paul wrote that unpreserved letter. It is here in Ephesus that Paul writes 1 Corinthians. It was from Ephesus that Paul made an emergency visit to the church in Corinth. And it was from Ephesus that he wrote the unpreserved, severe letter to the Corinthian church that is referred to in 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and 4, and 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 12. And that other le- that first, that, that first unpreserved letter was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. So he's doing all kinds of stuff here during his time here in Ephesus that Paul is working, just very fruitful. And then under the guidance of the Spirit, Paul resolved to leave Ephesus. So he's there, you know, so the Spirit says it's time. Paul, you've just served faithfully, you you know, tremendous ministry. But the Spirit for Paul saying it's time to move on. There are other things in mind for you. Okay, so under the guidance of the Spirit, he resolves to leave Ephesus and to revisit the provinces of Macedonia and Achaia before returning to Jerusalem. 
Now, he no doubt intended, of course, when he goes to Macedonia and Achaia, he intends to encourage the young churches there. But we know from his letters that he also was collecting from these Gentile churches. He was gathering. He was, he was involved in a collection. He was gathering funds from these churches to help the saints in Judea. And Paul was determined. So he's going to go. He's going to go back to Jerusalem with the funds he collects. And then he's determined to visit Rome after going to Jerusalem. That's Paul's plans. And he sends Timothy and Erastus. So he's, he, Paul's in Ephesus. He's in Asia. He sends Timothy and Erastus ahead of him, planning to go into Macedonia. He sends them up there ahead of him. And he remains in Ephesus for an unspecified length of time. He himself stayed in Asia for a while after sending Timothy and Erastus ahead of him to Macedonia. And during that time that Paul is there, remaining there, this huge disturbance breaks out in the city. This huge disturbance arose over the Christian religion. This big brouhaha arises over the Christian religion, and it was instigated by a silversmith, a man named Demetrius, who made and sold, see, he sold silver replicas, like we would call them souvenirs. He made and sold silver replicas of the massive temple of Artemis that was located in the city of Ephesus. And he also drew in business. This man, Demetrius, drew in business for other tradesmen. So he's a high-profile business kind of guy, and he makes his living selling these replicas of the Artemis shrine there in Ephesus. And he gets the tradesmen together, and he told them that Paul's message, Paul's message that man-made idols were nothing, well, that message was jeopardizing their livelihoods. I mean, he's looking down the road. He says, this guy's saying that man-made idols are worthless. Well, what are you building over here? Oh, it's a replica of Artemis' temple. What about that? That's, that's, that's nothing. These idols are nothing. Okay, so he says, look, that, that, that what's going to happen here is he's jeopardizing our livelihoods. And in fact, what he's saying risks diminishing the status of the great temple of Artemis and of even the goddess Artemis herself. So this is big, this is big stuff. Okay, of course, I always got that financial uh, thing back in the background. But he says this is really big stuff. And this enraged them. So he, you know, okay, so he's, he's hitting home. He's got the effect. He, it's enraged them. So they wind up crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They cry out that way. And this creates chaos in the city. City's just getting all, you know, just boiling. All kinds of stuff. We got chaos going on. And the growing crowd of protesters, people coming out, getting into the streets, this growing crowd of protesters, they rush to the theater. And it's a public space that that theater, by the way, could accommodate around 25,000 people. And so this was a large structure in Ephesus. And these guys, when they, when they go in there, they're not going alone, but they take with them Gaius and Aristarchus, these two Macedonians who were companions of the Apostle Paul. So they're dragging in these missionaries they're hoping they're going to get something done to them. They drag those guys in there. They want to persuade these city officials to take some kind of punitive action against these missionaries. Now, Paul wants to go into the crowd. You got, it's a hotbed. People appear, but Paul wants to go. And you know, Paul wants to go and talk to them and say, listen, I can straighten them out. I'll go in and I'll tell them the truth. But the brothers won't let him do it because the brothers understand, you know, like in a war, the king stays in the back. Not because the king's afraid. He's not the king. The king has gone to war many times. That's not an issue with the king. 
but because he's valuable and he's the, he's the highest level target. And so the brothers don't want Paul going in there because they understand, Paul, if you go in there, you are going to be the supreme lightning rod. It's all going to go, did somebody say Paul? <laughs> and we don't want that. And there are even some governing officials there who are friends of Paul. They hold a position, they're called Asiarchs. Friends of Paul and they concur. They say, listen man, you can't do that. Look, I, I know the place, I know the people, I see the crowd. No. It's going to, you'll wind up being killed in there. But I, I can straighten it out. You'll wind up getting killed, man. All right, so sometimes you got to say, okay, I'll listen to what's going on. Now, it was a confused and a disorderly assembly. People are shouting all kinds of stuff, right? Typical mob kind of scene. People are shouting all kinds of things. And most of the people, they don't even know why they're there. And you say, how could that be? Well, have you ever seen somebody go out and interview people who are gathered for some kind of protest or something? They'll go out and interview them and say, why are you here? And they got no idea. Why? I just kind of got caught up in the emotion. I'm chapped about all kinds of things in life. People are upset. I'm out of here. And so this is what's going on here. They'd simply been swept up in the emotion. They didn't know what was going on. And then the Jews, here in this crowd, now in the theater, we have a large crowd here, confused, angry, all kinds of stuff going on. And, and the Jews put forward a representative. This is the Jews. They put forward a representative, a man named Alexander. Now they're putting him forward to speak for them at the assembly. No doubt intending for him to distance the Jews from the Christians. So they put him up, and this isn't explained, but what they're doing, they want him up here, and they want him, listen, throw the Christians under the bus. <laughs> Make sure nobody thinks we're those guys. And so they put him forward to do this, and you have some other people there, presumably a Jewish contingent, who are shouting instructions to him. Some in the crowd prompted Alexander. Okay, man, go ahead. Say that. Say this. And so he's getting ready here. And Alexander motions to speak. So he's intending to make a defense for the Jews. But when the people there, when they recognized that he was a Jew, you see, an adherent of a monotheistic religion that rejected idols... Right? That's now become the hot issue. Paul is saying idols are nothing. The, the Jews put this guy up there. When they recognize he's a Jew, hey, wait a minute. Aren't you people, haven't you been telling us forever that you're monotheistic, that there's only one God? So when they recognize that he's a Jew, they shut him down. They did what we would say they canceled him. They shut him down by shouting for about two hours. Now you want a group of people who are hot. And who are so bent on their own identity and how threatened they feel. Two hours they wind up shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, you can just see like a ball game sometimes. You'll have the crowd break out into a, you know, where they're taunting somebody. See, I'm old enough to remember Daryl Strawberry. Daryl, Daryl. All right, so you can see this kind of thing, but this goes on for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the town clerk, who's not some low-level functionary, the town clerk is the chief magistrate. The chief magistrate in Ephesus, he quiets the crowd and he reassures them there was no need to fear that the reputation or fame of their goddess or their city, its fame and its glory, as the keeper of Artemis's temple and as the keeper of the sacred stone that fell from the sky which is presumably a meteorite that had fallen and had been incorporated into the uh, into the temple of Artemis so like he says there's no need to worry about this there's no need to fear that the reputation of the goddess or the city 
is going to be dis- diminished. He says, look, those things are beyond dispute. You don't have to worry about the reputation being diminished. Those things cannot be denied. So his point is, you see, that does not give you a legitimate motivation for what you're doing. If word of this gets back to the proconsul, that's not going to fly. And you say, well, why are you doing this? And somebody winds up saying, well, I was doing it because I was concerned that they were going to diminish the glory of Artemis or the city of Ephesus. And he's going to go, that's not going to fly. You see, he's not going to accept that as, as legitimate basis. They had dragged men to the assembly. They dragged men there, see, with no charges. They didn't have charges of sacrilegious actions against the temple. No charges that they had blasphemed the goddess Artemis. They said, look, you bring them here and you make no public charges. You know, in American society, right, all of Western society, you have a distinction between civil law and criminal law. Criminal law, those things are violations against the society. Civil law are personal infractions. I sue you in civil court. I'm prosecuted criminally for criminal violations. That's the distinction, see, that's being put up here. He says, look, you guys, you you have brought people here with no allegations of what we would call criminal conduct. No allegations of offenses to the society. There's nothing about blaspheming the goddess. There are no sacrilegious actions that were taken against the temple. Now, if Demetrius and these other craftsmen, if they have been wronged personally, in other words, if, if they have a civil cause of action against these people, well, the courts are open. That's the solution. If you've been wronged civilly, the courts are open and they're available for these disputes. You see, if there was indeed, and, and if there had been a bona fide public offense, a, a criminal offense, something against the society, well, then the proper procedure was to wait for a regular meeting of the assembly. That's what you're supposed to do, which would have been not more than a week or so away. So if that were the case, what you needed to do was, you know, we're orderly and we have an upcoming meeting of the assembly, and that's where that would have needed. Not this all of a sudden inflamed group of people running down here. Now this was a concern for them. This was a concern for cities about how they would appear. And you see the clerk's concern. It's reflected in verse 40. He says, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. That's his concern. He's here. He's the magistrate of a city. He's not the proconsul. He's afraid word's going to get to the proconsul. I'm going to be called on the carpet in front of him and I'm going to have nothing to say that I can justify what's happened. I can't do that. I. Howard Marshall, in his commentary, he says, the clerk's final words betray his fear that the holding of an extraordinary meeting of the assembly, which had turned into a near riot, might have serious repercussions. Sherwin White, who's spent a lot of time studying these kinds of things, cites interesting evidence from this period, which shows that the Romans were anxious to get rid of these democratic assemblies. All right, so let's drop it into the political context. You know, they're still enjoying some level of these kinds of democratic assemblies, and this guy's going, well, you're killing me. <laughs> he says, you guys act this way, and this gets to the pro council. You don't think they're itching to, sh- to destroy and take away this, this right? And so he says here, uh, Romans were anxious to get rid of these democratic assemblies. The town clerk of Prusa addressed his assembly in remarkably similar terms, warning his hearers about the drastic consequences of reports of unruly gatherings reaching the proconsul. The clerk's appeal was successful and the assembly dismissed. So far as we can tell, no further steps were taken publicly or privately by the silversmiths against Paul and his colleagues. So that's what happened. That's what dispersed the crowd. When the clerk comes in and says, and helps them realize their own self-interest, that if you do this, 
You are jeopardizing our way of life here because the Roman government will not take what kindly to it, and you may wind up costing us. All right. All right. You know, so, that, so they disperse, and that's what, that's what winds up happening there. And then after that uproar had ceased, after that uproar had ceased, Paul, of course, he gathers the disciples. He gathers them and encourages them, and he then departs for Macedonia. Okay, he was intending to go to Macedonia, right? He sends Timothy and Erastus up there. In advance, he's going there. He waits here for a bit in Ephesus, and while he's there, this riot breaks out. Okay, so Paul, though, he's, he's ready to go to Macedonia. He departs for Macedonia, and we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, that he goes to Macedonia by way of Troas. Okay, so he's here in Ephesus. He's going up here to Macedonia where you have the cities of Philippi and Thessalonica. And we know that he goes there by way of Troas. So this is, this is where he, he stops there in Troas. And he's, he was hoping there. He's not only going to preach in Troas, but he was hoping that he would, he would meet Titus there who's returning with news of how the Corinthians had received Paul's severe letter, an unpreserved letter, but he refers to it. So he had sent that to the Corinthians, and he's going to Macedonia by way of Troas, and he's in Troas not only to preach, but he's hoping that Titus will meet him in Troas, returning with news, how did they take it? How did, how did they receive it? He's very anxious about this, if that's the right word. Eager to learn what is going on. So he, he's there. Now, when Titus doesn't show, Paul then continues on to Macedonia, which, as I say, that's where Philippi and Thessalonica and other cities are. Apparently, this was in keeping with a contingency plan that he had with Titus. So it must have been something like, look, if you get to where you you understand that you can't make it to Troas by this date, well, then you sit tight here and I'll meet you there. So something like that. So he goes into Macedonia, and Luke reports that, that in Macedonia, Paul gave much encouragement to the saints in that region, as of course he would. And brothers and sisters, so Paul is all about encouraging them. And we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 4 and chapter 9, verse 2, that he also is busy organizing this collection that he was taking up from the Gentile churches for the poor Jewish Christians in Judea. And this was important. It not only was benevolence, which is good and right in itself, but it was also it was a great theological statement about the unity of the church, that the Gentile churches give to the Jewish church and the Jewish church accepts it as you see, so there were theological implications of this beyond the benevolence. But here, the, the Macedonian churches were themselves facing, Paul says, the most severe trial and extreme poverty. You see that in 2 Corinthians 8 too. And yet they insisted, they insisted on participating in the contribution and they gave with extreme generosity. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. So this is the situation. I heard that bell. So here he is in Macedonia. He's waiting for Titus' word. He didn't come to him. He gets up there in Macedonia. Titus not there yet, but he's, he's busy collecting, and he's going to send this money. And I just look at these, these churches up here, and they're suffering and getting the hair, but they said, we got to get in on this. But you, I don't care. I want to express you, you, know, you know how it's going to cost you to sacrifice? I want to express my faith, my support, my love for my brothers and sisters. I'm in. And that's who they were. I heard that bell.